All right, so yeah, this is, I'm about to get real personal with you guys, so we're just, we'll take it really informal, and, and my apologies, I was, um, I think Chris was, you know, I'm not a, a parent of someone with a rare disease, I'm a patient, so hopefully some of this is applicable, and you guys, you know, just tell me, and we can zoom through and, and stay on things, if there are topics that you just want to talk about, we can do that. So, all right. Uh, Hi everyone, my name is Dakota Fisher-Vance. Uh, very excited to, to be here with this group. And uh, yeah, I have been uh, contemplating a lot about the theme of uh, this weekend, of soaring higher. Uh, and I like puns, so hopefully you can see that reflected in the title there. Um, it's really something that I think propelled me um, through my ascent into young adulthood um, as I sought to set myself apart uh, from the rest and climb to the top of the class. And, uh, you know, hopefully in my eventual profession, I wanted to really, um, you know, soar above everybody. Of course, back then, um, I wasn't <laughs> so aware that, irrespective of my body of work, that my body was already distinguishing me quite a lot into truly rarefied air. Uh, so, just for some background, um, let's see, slide. Uh, in 2011, I was that typical, uh, ambitious but naive, uh, young and invincible pre-med. I had just graduated from Bryn Mawr College uh, with a degree in biology, a fantastic job lined up, and a perceivably healthy body, with the exception of my very active chocolate addiction and travel bug. Uh, sure, my stool hadn't been uh, fully formed since I was 18, but that also coincided with when I started college and started eating cake for breakfast every day. Uh, so I didn't think too much of it, but uh, to be fair, uh, even with a positive hemocult test or a stool test that detects uh, blood in the stool, uh, my effervescent youth and personality swayed my newly acquired GI when I did eventually seek help to nick my, uh, nip my medical problems in the butt um, upon graduating. Uh, and uh, he suggested that I had a celiac diagnosis and proposed a colonoscopy in a few months. Um, celiac di diagnosis didn't really sit well with me. Um, did I mention I was eating cake for breakfast? Uh, but apparently neither did the draining anemia uh, worsening unbeknownst to me. It landed me in the ER two weeks later and uh, expedited my colonoscopy, which revealed thousands of polyps in my colon, and in conjunction with genetic testing, a diagnosis of familial adenomatous polyposis, FAP for short, um, which predisposes me to a bunch of different types of cancers and guarantees the development of colon cancer under the age of 40. Uh, so just as I was about to launch myself into the world to start making my mark, I needed to reestablish residency in my old childhood room to recover from surgeries to remove my colon and most of my rectum. And I wanted so desperately to soar, um, but instead I needed to focus on sorting out and prolonging my life in a fundamentally different manner than what I was accustomed to. All right, um, so now that we have dramatically set the stage, uh, let me just tell you how I generally summarize uh, what happens from this moment of diagnosis and where I am now. Uh, so here we go, here's my little elevator pitch. Uh, no longer wanting to study the functions of the colon, I toss my MCAT book aside. Uh, and being on the other side of the stethoscope, I started to see some deficiencies in patient care, particularly around patient advocacy and patient education, and wondered if I needed another decade's worth of schooling to try and impact change. Uh, and then my career took a very roundabout path, and while I was teaching abroad, I ended up uh, developing a rare soft tissue sarcoma uh, that I'd actually predicted I was going to develop based on my research of the disease and my risk factors, but my concerns were dismissed by my medical team. At the time that I developed this tumor, um, that's when I really knew I couldn't just put this disease in a box and sort of compartmentalize it, that I needed to learn to live with it. Uh, and in order to do that, I needed to meet other people who could relate. Uh, of course, when I tried to find uh, people who had met cancer after childhood and um, before adulthood, it was like an elusive game of hide and seek. So I started a group for young adults with cancer in Philadelphia, where I'm based, and we hosted Philly's first young adult cancer conference. Uh, and I also started the first ever YouTube channel for people with my disease. You technically can Google me and see me talking about my bowel habits online. Please don't. Um, <laughs> So yeah, when I say I'm an open book, I really am. I've talked about like my poop on the internet. Um, so I also technically can say that I've been discovered on YouTube. Um, that YouTube channel was uh, found by a health tech startup that created online communities for specific rare diseases. 
Uh, yeah, and so they brought me up for some marketing material because their first uh, model disease was my disease. And uh, by the end of it, they offered me a job. And while I was there, our clients were predominantly pharmaceutical companies. And uh, that's how I got introduced to the field that I currently am in, which is professional patient advocacy. And I eventually met my future boss, who she was a client, and she happened to be hiring and was lucky enough to get the job. And then eventually moved over to Biochris Pharmaceuticals, where I am now. And somehow, I'm really lucky that I get paid to elevate patient community voices in the drug development process. It's like my day job. How cool is that? So yeah, that's, that's the pitch. Um, and people hear this, and they tend to conclude that I am indeed soaring after all. Uh, since my diagnosis, one of the most common remarks I, I've heard from friends, family, and acquaintances alike uh, revolves around how I've risen above my disease, and it just being how remarkable how far I've come since my diagnosis, given my whole health situation. And I get it, it's a compelling story, right? It's filled with perseverance and making uh, lemonade from lemons. The thing is, uh, while it's not untrue, it, this story doesn't paint the full picture. And in fact, is a very distilled down and judiciously curated recounting. What I don't share is that not only was I not rising above my disease in those early years, I was in fact in one of the deepest, darkest places I've ever been, following both of my cancer diagnoses. Instead of soaring, I was a sore loser in the DNA lottery. I was utterly lost in depression, and removing my colon involved two surgeries uh, with a three-month period in between where I had an ostomy, which is an external appliance that collected my stool that was on my abdomen. I was shrouded in shame, I was embarrassed by my body, and as a result, I only left the house five times in those three months for non-medical reasons. Um, and despite it being the dawn of the era of the selfie, these are the only photos I have of me in those whole three months. I share this not to take us in the total opposite direction of the topic for this session, uh, but as a reminder that resilience isn't something you're born with, uh, that you either have or you lack. It's a skill and one that you have to hone and practice. It can get rusty and it can falter from time to time. And it's precisely because I've been in this truly terrible place that I'm constantly trying to take stock of and fortify the practices that led me out. And it's why I'd like to share with you some of the hard-earned learnings that I've learned through trial and error um, and experiences that have helped me cultivate resilience in dealing with my rare disease. Okay, so this is a little, I've never done a talk on resilience. I've done talks on self-advocacy. So I'll say like this, the takeaway is not that I have all the answers because I absolutely don't. Um, and I'm also trying something new in terms of like sharing insights. So we'll see, we'll see how it goes. So bear with me. Uh, <laughs> great. It's going to share, it's, it's a little bit more like picture and story heavy and we'll just sort of go through for however much time allows us. Um, so one of the early lessons that I picked up um, in dealing with sort of living with my diagnosis was uh, that while my diagnosis absolutely changed a lot about my life, um, and my life was still very much divided into before cancer and after diagnosis, and I did have this mutant DNA, uh, that there just were certain fundamental things about me that this disease wasn't gonna change. And I learned that actually by working abroad. Um, that job I mentioned was the first job I had after recovering from surgeries. And despite the fact that I was a world traveler, it was one of my favorite things to do before I got diagnosed, I almost didn't take the job because I thought that that person who loved traveling no longer existed. But I ended up going, and uh, after months of not even finding contentment, I suddenly discovered happiness again. And that's when I realized, oh, there are still things about me that just, they're just innately true. Um, and we really need to ground ourselves in those immutable traits because otherwise the disease and the things that we can't control are gonna take focus. So we need to make sure we're constantly aware of the holistic picture of who we truly are. Uh, so just for example, some of some things that are innately true about me, I love traveling, which works very well because I also love tra uh, trying food and uh, that's one of my favorite things to do. Unfortunately, losing a colon hasn't uh, shifted that. Um, I've also found that my interests, uh, there's three main interests that I think really I was interested in learning more about and incorporating to my career, uh, you know, community, healthcare, and education. Those still remain true and they're actually very much incorporated into what I do now. I didn't end up pursuing going into medicine, um, but I still found a way to, to bring these to light. 
Uh, so I know we we're just talking about immutable traits, um, but let's be real, having a rare disease definitely comes with a lot of side effects. Um, and you know, I think we have a tendency to focus on the physical side effects, but it's important to take note of all the other ways that your disease can impact you. Um, yeah, I, there are all sorts of ways that, that my disease uh, played a role in my life in, in interesting ways. Uh, so for example, I picked up baking. Um, it's a I couldn't do a lot when I was recovering from surgeries physically, so I wanted to still contribute. So it, this is a hobby that I still pursue to this day. Um, and then also, I mean, sometimes when, like, this disease leads to weird things. Um, the one I like to highlight is the one in the, the middle there, those top two photos, those were taking 48 hours apart. There was a cancer nonprofit that was doing a uh, fundraising uh, fashion show and they asked me to be a model, which I mean, I'm five foot modeling is not part of my, uh, <laughs> was not something I envisioned. And then uh, the run right next to it, there's another cancer charity that they had invited me to come to an award ceremony where they're being honored in the Rainbow Room, which is this really swanky place in, in New York City. And uh, it led me, the, the confluence of these two events led me to utter probably like the weirdest sentence I'll ever utter, which was, oh gosh, I've got to call Saks to see if they can move my wardrobe fitting so I can make it up to the rainbow room in time. My life is not that fancy, like you'll never hear me say that again, probably. Um, when it comes to non-physical side effects, I think uh, the biggest impact that my disease has had on my life is in how I connect with other people. Um, you know, obviously when you have a serious illness, especially when you're a young adult and, you know, your peers maybe have only encountered illness in the context of their grandparents, um, it leads to a lot of elephants in the room that you have to navigate. And I think those elephants are, you know, it was a large reason why I was so depressed and self-isolating really early on because I just felt like I couldn't relate to any of my peers and therefore I had no idea how to tell them what I was experiencing and thinking. Um, but fortunately, I've had some epiphanies since then that have helped. Uh, the first one is uh, over on the right, the woman in the black. That's my friend Lise. Uh, I've known her before my diagnosis, college friends. Didn't really think we ever had a whole lot in common, actually. Uh, and that picture was taken at a wedding. And a little bit later, after the wedding ended, uh, I got that we're all adults in the room, we were a little inebriated, and I got really emotional and started sharing stuff about my health, and afterwards I was mortified. Um, but a few weeks later, she wrote me, and she said how appreciative she was that I got vulnerable with her. And she said that even though she could never understand what it was like to have cancer, that she really related to a lot that I said, not because she had a serious health issue, but because she grew up with financial disadvantage, and she never knew how to talk to her peers, myself included, about that. And that realization um, made me connect that, you know, everyone has a story, right? Like, it may not be cancer, um, but chances are everything, everyone's dealing with something that in some way, shape, or form we can relate to. And it helped me just feel way less isolated with the world and much more comfortable sharing openly with people. Um, and then, of course, there's the other side of the spectrum, which is probably one of my favorite things to do, which I like to affectionately call meeting my cellmates. So that's meeting people who actually, you know, understand what it's like to have a serious disease. Um, and I really do attribute doing that to, um, you know, just as much as my medical interventions to the reason that I'm still here today. Um, I think probably everyone in the room, everyone at this conference knows the power of connecting people with people who truly get it. You know, it not just provides um, a forum to talk about things like cancer jokes, which just aren't generally appreciated in the general public. Um, but when you bring together the group of, of young adults with cancer, young adults with ichthyosis, you just never know what's going to come out of it. Um, and this picture here, I've got a lot, I'm fortunate to have a lot of pictures with um, my cellmates, but is with some folks I met through one of my favorite uh, patient advocacy initiatives I've ever done and, and gotten to be a part of, which was a uh, video series that was produced. Um, it was written, it was filmed and edited and acted entirely by young adults with cancer experience about how to talk to your friend who's a young adult with cancer. And the reason that I loved this so much was not just because I got to throw a sandwich in someone's face, which was a lot of fun, but uh, it's because this is the resource I most wanted when I was diagnosed. And I knew we were going to help people navigate some of those elephants. That being said, even with additional tools and additional learnings, um, you know, we're all still human and we have a tendency to put our feet in our mouths. Um, and I have and probably will continue to uh, hear some awkward and even offensive comments in relation to my health. Uh, for example, I was uh, on a date once and I had recently disclosed to him about my diagnosis. And we're kissing and all of a sudden he pulls back 
And he looks at me and he's like, wait a second, are you contagious? Not I do. Um, I let him know that my hereditary condition was contagious and walked out of the room. But during that time, uh, you know, all, when I heard stuff like this, it would make me so angry and so frustrated. But I eventually decided, you know, the better path is to try and give people grace as hard as it can be. Um, because generally speaking, people are, I think, well-meaning. And that's coming from a diehard pessimist. I think it's just <laughs> they've never experience. They've, they've never talked to someone like me. So instead, I'll try to, um, you know, say, hey, I think this is the information you're looking for. And, you know, here's a way you might be able to ask that um, better in the future. All right, I've got to move on because I could spend all day on that slide. But um, speaking of putting your foot in your mouth, uh, I really encourage everyone to find humor in managing your, your loved one's disease as much as possible. The reality is, is being sick is sometimes just utterly ridiculous and we need to laugh at it. Also, it can help you uh, get through those really mortifying moments and move on, um, like the time where I first met my rabbi. And I was definitely soaring high on a lot of the medications that the hospital had given me, and I proceeded to tell him to get the F out of my room and curse him out. That's how I met my rabbi. Terribly mortifying. Um, now I find it a fun anecdote. Uh, my favorite other story for levity's sake is uh, the time where my friend and her then roommate tried to set me up with someone. Um, and as it turns out, that person also was missing a colon. Um, and the reason they were setting us up is solely because we both missed the same organ. I don't know if like they have discovered the new dating app trend, like meet your soulmate. Like they also miss the same organ, but I find it hilarious. Uh, okay, now we're being serious. Back to being serious. Uh, so I think um, you know I should note that I don't tend to think of myself as a resilient person, or what I do is resilient. Um, it's really just trying to do what I need. Um, so when I started that group for young adults with cancer and we held that conference, quite frankly, it was because I needed that connectivity. Um, and actually the, the keynote speaker we had, uh, she's a woman by the name of Salika Jawad, who uh, at the time was writing a New York Times column about uh, her experience as a young adult with cancer. And her words were the first time I ever realized I wasn't alone in having this. They were truly life-changing words for me. They were the catalyst for me to get involved in advocacy. And I was determined to have her because, not just because she'd be a great speaker, but because I knew it would be a really cathartic experience for myself and be very full circle, and it was. And if you haven't heard her, definitely check her out. Uh, a YouTube channel, same, same thing. Um, I didn't tell you that my acronym for my disease unfortunately hasn't, uh, unfo you know, yeah, <laughs> you're shaking your head, she knows. Um, unfortunate association with an urban slang word for male masturbation. So when I first started looking at my disease, I found some really unhelpful stuff that was about the one organ that my disease doesn't potentially impact, so shame. Um, and I just thought that was really cruel, and I thought we needed a friendly face for people who are looking up something, you know, really, really tough, um, and very reluctantly became that friendly face, definitely not a YouTuber by, yeah, by far. Um, and I think doing what you need really looks like a lot of different things, right? Um, like in the case of that picture at the bottom there, sometimes it's ending up in the ER and needing to go like right go right from the ER to work because you have to you have no choice but sometimes it's canceling plans because you need to rest um, the top picture up there I know we've talked a lot about travel in the previous section um, but that picture I was really really sick on the trip it was I was in Thailand it was one of my early trips and my GI system just totally acted up I didn't know what to do, would I go to, like, how would I go to the ER and, you know, the, this random fishing village in, uh, in Thailand. And the thing was, I figured it out because I needed to. It's a cool story to tell now, but, like, that I always advocate for people to take trips. Even if it's a day trip, get out of your comfort zone because that's where you learn to trust your body. Um, and you're going to, like, if something goes wrong, you're going to figure it out because what other choice do you have? Um, and I've learned that through traveling. Um, and I think centering it around like your work around what do I need to do as opposed to how am I going to be resilient today or how am I going to try and save the world or climb Mount Everest and look like this really triumphant patient or caregiver that's just it feels insurmountable so that's why I like just repurposing it as like what do I need and yeah it's, it's not resilience as much as maybe selfishness but I think that's for me how I get stuff done uh, and while you're trying to do what you need to do, uh, I advocate for you to use what you have. 
Um, this is a picture of my colon's last meal, which I took to a very fancy restaurant, in case you're wondering. Um, it also happened to be the first time I played the cancer card, the proverbial cancer card, um, which if you don't know, if you have had cancer, it sounds like now actually there's the, what is it, the skin for the win? Um, it sounds like that might be the repurposed version for the ichthyosis community, which I love. Uh, but yeah, the cancer card, one of my favorite questions to ask when I'm in a room full of folks with cancer is like, what's your favorite time that you've used the cancer card? One of my best friend's boyfriend used it to get a deal on his car. Um, like, oh, I need to pick up my girlfriend from chemo. Um, so anyway, yeah, it's really, yeah, people have some good stories. But in all seriousness, like, there's a reason that we have this card or that, you know, you folks have access to the ichthyosis card. And it's because sometimes we actually do need help and we do need people to understand that, like, by the way, we've got this disease. Um, and also, like, don't forget the skills that you've gained outside of dealing with the disease. Um, like for example, for me, I did have basic scientific literacy from my undergraduate experience and that allowed me to research my disease and has been instrumental in, in my management. So uh, I also really challenge you to periodically revisit what your preferences are, what your goals are, what you're looking to do. As you probably gathered, I really, when I was diagnosed, wanted nothing to do with uh, meeting patients or having this impact my social life in any way. Uh, but obviously that changed over time. I actually find it really hilarious now that like my whole job is meeting and hearing from patients and back then like absolutely not. Uh, and so when I was diagnosed early on, I came across exactly one person who was around my age who had my exact disease. And it was from this organization at the time called the Colon Club and they produced a publication or a calendar where people with early onset colorectal cancer would sort of bear it all and uh, get photographed. Um, and I was like, this is the most helpful thing. This is so empowering. I'm so glad this exists, but absolutely not. Never in a million years would I ever do a photo shoot about early onset colorectal cancer. Fast forward a few years and there I am on the cover because my preferences changed quite a lot and it was really a phenomenal experience. Uh, and then lastly, I just I encourage everyone to make sure periodically you take time to reflect. Um, you know, I think it's really easy to get lost in the day-to-day -day in general, but also the day-to-day -day of managing disease, doctors, visits, scans, they blur together after a certain point, and we sometimes lose track of all the things we've done and, and perhaps indeed how far we've come. Uh, the first set of pictures over there is, is sort of a contrast to one of those early slides I shared um, wherein I only had a few photos of me um, with my ostomy. Uh, since then, I've made a pact with myself where every time I have a health appointment, I take a photo. Um, I call it affectionately chemo realism. That's my internal name for it. Um, but I don't share these photos or post them, generally speaking. In fact, most people haven't seen uh, the top ones relatively recent, my recent scan. Uh, they gave me pants that were like way too big for me, and I just appreciated that. Um, so anyway, it's like one, it encourages me to appreciate, find appreciation or humor or something interesting and different that I haven't seen in a medical appointment. But two, it's for me to look back on and track. This is where I've been. The middle example requires a little bit of context. Um, so when I was diagnosed with my soft tissue sarcoma a few years ago, the standard of care was surgery if it could be removed. Um, however, I believed from the research I'd done as well as my risk factors that surgery was the absolute last possible thing that you could do um, and that it would make things exponentially worse. Uh, however, second opinion after second opinion all said surgery, get it removed which I was refusing. Um, but eventually I relented because I was so emotionally worn down by my loved ones who thought that I was refusing because I was giving up. Uh, so I just told them, fine, pick a surgeon. I don't care who, I think this is a bad idea, but I'll do it. Got really lucky that the surgeon I went to um, took one look at me and said, no, I wouldn't do surgery on you. Uh, and he put me on an, uh, an off-label use of an oral chemotherapy, which I was on for several years, uh, which shrunk the tumor a little bit and, and has stabilized it and hasn't grown since. Um, fast forward to about five years later, the standard of care has completely shifted and now surgery is the last, a total last resort. Um, and I was at a patient conference sort of similar to this in my own disease for this, this tumor. And when I heard that, I, I was taken aback. It, it sort of caught me off guard. Um, I, I found myself starting to tear up. Um, and it's because I forgot, it had been so long that I forgot the emotion and the arguments that happened around this very topic. And I think to hear that, that I, after all that, as it turned out, I was right. Um, I just, I can't actually describe the, you know, the meaning that that had for me and really reiterates the value of self-advocacy. I mean, if I had had that surgery, my quality of life would be like dramatically different. 
Uh, and then the last picture, um, that's uh, Kara, who is the co-founder of the young adult cancer group that I run. Um, and she's also the first young adult with cancer that I ever met. Uh, that conversation also changed my trajectory. And I remember sitting across the table with, from her and I was hearing just about all these great things, you know, about her then boyfriend who became her husband, her grad school, her job, and I just was in awe. I was like, oh my goodness, you have this whole life that is not dictated by cancer. But I remember thinking, that's amazing, but that's not for me because Unlike her, I'm never going to be in remission. I'm always going to be scanning and at risk for more cancer, and just cancer is a part of my life. So a few years ago, I was driving home, and it just it suddenly hit me, I, like out of nowhere, that I was like, holy crap, like, I don't think about cancer all that much. I mean, sure, in my work, it comes up, but it's not really defining my life so much. And it just snuck up on me, like something that I thought was totally impossible just by continuing to live and learn and try here I was. Um, so yeah, I think to me that, that was a really liberating realization and I think um, it definitely speaks towards the, the importance of self-reflection um, about your disease or about your caregiving experience. Um, and it really brings me back to one of those earlier remarks which I tend to get, which is, oh my gosh, it's, it's so remarkable um, how far you've come since your diagnosis. Um, and it's something I've been trying to remind myself of a lot more lately. So yeah, sure, I've gotten to this great place where I don't really think too much about my cancer all the time, um, which is great. And I, However, I've been recently reminded that it's highly likely I will develop cancer again. It's really a matter of when, not if. Uh, and yeah, I won't lie, it's been really tough to get back into gear of some of those things that I've talked about that have helped me so much and helped me build that resilience. So, you know, researching my disease, uh, trying to figure out how to talk with friends about this. Um, yeah, it's still really hard and I'm out of practice. Um, one of the biggest fears that I have about my disease is not so much more cancer, but it's that fear of returning to that really deep, dark place that I was in. Um, however, the reality is, is I'm not that same person I was in 2011. Um, you know, I, I, if I get cancer again, it would be terrible. It's, th it's gonna suck, that's just the reality. Um, but uh, this time around, I now have resources, I have realizations, I have people that I didn't have before that can help me hopefully sort through it and get back to soaring. So yeah, <laughs> that's it. Thank you so much for soaring through this presentation with me. <laughs> Thank you.